Hi everyone, this is uh, Walter Baum. Welcome to my lecture on modern American short fiction. Uh, I'm going to go over the history with you and also go over uh, the short stories that we're going to be reading or have read in uh, AP Lang and English Three Honors. All right, so these are the, well, it's out of order, so actually, yeah, about 16 stories. Um, and hopefully you have read all of these. And we're going to be um, having a discussion. You're going to be writing a comparison contrast essay. So let me continue. You should be able to, um, if you look at these words, um, define, locate, and apply the following. Uh, we'll be doing this all year, so this is not like going to be a quiz tomorrow on all these different things. But, you know, recognize when there is foreshadowing. Well, seeing where the, uh, the conflict uh, comes in like in Hills Like White Elephants, about uh, it's, it's just a simple operation. Um, the vernacular, using common everyday speech and hyperbole, exaggeration for effect. So most of these should be familiar uh, to you. All right, let's uh, begin with the definition of what is short fiction, all right? Um, short story, right? A short story, short fiction, both used interchangeably, uh, is a short work of fiction. That means it's made up. A counterfeit coming from the Latin fictio, pretending or act or shaping. Word count varies, right? There are short shorts of 50 words. But generally, a short story is 500 to 15,000 words. And anything like Old Man of the Sea and of Mice and Men and The, Di uh, the Death of Ivan Illich by uh, Tolstoy, they're usually a novella, which is in between a novel which is a long work of fiction and a short story. So a novella is often is oftentimes right in that middle ground. So Old Man in the Sea is considered a novella, although it is much shorter than a regular novel. Really, the form was popularized uh, by our own American uh, liter uh, writer and literary critic, Edgar Allan Poe. We usually think of Poe almost always exclusively as a writer of gothic stories or you know his famous raven or annabelle lee but he was also a huge um literary critic and he would write reviews about different works that were published and he believed and he had this theory in this single uh, single effect that a story should be effective it should be read in one sitting in order to fully absorb the reader, much like watching a movie from start to finish without interruption. That Poe said there should be one conceived emotional effect. Okay. Now, but should a story only have one effect? Now, I'm just positing this. One could, or perhaps, should be critical of such a position. But the idea of being immersed in a story in one sitting is worthy and one that we can all attest to. Like when you go to the movie theater, or when we did go to movie theaters, we would sit down, eat our popcorn, and be immersed in that world, right? If you watch Netflix, you know, and you're watching a movie, you want to be able to see the entire thing. Now, with series, we break and we stop and, you know, but there's nothing like um, being sitting there enmeshed in that world. All right, the form, Poe wrote in 1842 in reviewing Nathaniel Hawthorne's Twice Told Tales that this is where he got the effect, the singular effect, is in reviewing Hawthorne's uh, 1842 collection. That he said, a skillful artist has constructed the tale. If wise, he has not fashioned his thoughts to accommodate his incidents, but having conceived with a deliberate care a certain unique or single effect to be wrought out, he then invents such incidents. He then combines such events as may be best aid him in establishing this preconceived effect. This is all Poe's words. If his very initial sentence tends not to bring to the outbringing of this effect, then he has failed in his first step. In the whole composition, there should be no word written of which the tendency, direct or indirect, is not to the one pre-established pre design. All right, let's talk about let's let's still talk about Poe because he's so influential with the uh, uh, the modern short story. Today, Poe is known as the short story writer, as a, as I've said. Um, we know about the Raven, Annabelle Lee, Bells, Bells, Bells. 
He's also credited with creating the true detective story. All right, so if you love mysteries, uh, if you love Agatha Christie and things like that, uh, he created the short story Portal and Ladder, Murders in the Rue Morgue, the French detective uh, Auguste Dupont, uh, Herker Perot, the French detective from Agatha Christie, largely based on this French detective, all right? His only long work of fiction, a novel, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, he called a very silly book. <laughs> I haven't read it, um, but uh, even even uh, Poe said, it's a very silly work. And sometimes authors realize where their brilliance lies, and writing long works of fiction may not have been one of Poe's. Having not read it, I can't really give any you know, maybe it's good. I have no idea. All right, let's go back. Let's go back really far back. All right, I see the really the first story form is illustrated in the book of Job in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, we have a narrative frame. It's very rich in imagery. It was written between the 4th and 7th and 4th century before Common Era. There's monologues. We have a protagonist. We kind of have a God-devil antagonist who set out to test the faith of the faithful Job, right? Early models, much later than this, of course, we have tales that form part of a frame story, like the Canterbury Tales or Boccaccio's The Cameron. Shakespeare borrowed many storylines from The Cameron. Shakespeare did not come up with, like, Romeo and Juliet or Othello. It was like, okay, there's the story that was already established, and then he just takes it, and makes it amazing, okay? It creates it in a play form with all the rich imagery and characterization and everything that we love about William Shakespeare. We also have the famous fables of Aesop, where you have animals talking. And of course, we have the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm and, you know, Little Mermaid or things like that. So this is all leading up to the modern creation of the short story form. Okay, let's talk about now American literature. This is what, of course, we're studying. In America, Washington Irving, known as the father of American literature, traveled throughout Europe, was an ambassador to Spain, and collected European fairy tales like Hans Christian Andersen and Brothers Grimm, and he refashioned these tales with American settings. They're largely set in the fairy mountains of the Catskills in lower New York, and the stories have a supernatural and romantic flavor. Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow are his most famous works. And I'm sure you have heard of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Rip Van Winkle, we can also attribute um, the the foundation of American humor. I'm not going to say the foundation, but um, Ben Franklin was a big part of that as well. Um, But Rip Van Winkle is a a character... um, also set the American archetype of a lazy but likable dad, think Homer Simpson or King of Queens or Everyone Loves Raymond, who gets nagged by his termagant wife. That means someone who's always nagging him and just wants to escape into the woods to hunt with his dog. He drinks with dwarves in the magical woods, drinks their special drink, and wakes up after the American Revolution to find that another King George now controls the country. We had King George III. Now we have kind of like George Washington. But he's happy to find that his wife is dead and will no longer be heckled and can live in peace. Washington Irving also created these uh, the Knickerbocker Tales. His first novel, um, it was an early history of New York, uh, a satire of uh, New York politics. And that's, of course, where we get the New York Knicks. Okay, we had uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, in his essays, most notably the American Scholar Speech at Harvard, he wanted American artists to break free of Europe, right? So Washington Irving going to Europe as inspiration, Emerson's like, stop. This is America. We need American artists and American themes. He says, there are new men. There are new, new, oh, this is bad. There are new men, new lands, new thoughts. America needed its own literature. So Hawthorne and Poe arrive as the leading writers of the short story form, along with Herman Melville and his great story, 
are to be the Scrivener, which hopefully later in the year, when we talk about transcendentalism and civil disobedience, we will be able to read that. Okay, away from Romanticism, uh, after World War, after Civil War II, after uh, after the Civil War, we have uh, the Age of Realism, right? What's more, what's what, what can be more real than the after effects of the Civil War? So we have Ambrose Pierce in 1890 writing occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. We have Charlotte Perkins Gilman in the Yellow Wallpaper, which you have read. Uh, we have Henry James's Daisy Miller and Jack London's To Build a Fire. Edith Wharton, Roman Fever, uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening, which is, I wouldn't say a novella, it's a very long short story. Um, and of course, Story of an Hour. Many of these, uh, of course, we will read or have read. Then we get into the after effects of World War I. We have The Lost Generation, and this is just an outpouring of amazing short stories from Hemingway. Uh, Sherwood Anderson, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Irish um, great James Joyce and Dubliners, William Faulkner's amazing short stories, uh, Barn Burning, Dry September, and of course, uh, A Rose for Emily. 1930-1975, we have Harlem Renaissance writers, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, um, Langston Hughes, writing both in poetry, narrative, short stories. We have Eudora Welty, a lot of Southern fiction, Flannery O'Connor, Alice Walker, Joyce Carol Oates. And of course, the modern short story is still widely produced in major magazines like The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and writers uh, like Lahiri just published a knockout collection called The Unaccustomed Earth. The short story form is a great way for students and teachers and readers to gain access to a wide range of voices and styles and themes with a broad range of artists, Gothic, realism, romanticism, and powerful themes of alienation on race and sexism. All right, so I theorized, I was thinking about this, like, why is the short story form so popular in the United States? I forget what writer it was, Frank O'Connor or Frank Norris, or I forget who, I got to track this down. Like, the short story is like the art form um, of, of the United States. Like opera, we think of Italy, right? We think of... Um, ballet Russian right we think of the the great novels we think of like England with Dickens and and Thackeray and Jane Austen America though man produces probably the best short fiction even though we have other writers like Anton Chekhov and Maupassant and other writers in the world writing short stories American writers really have made the short story form popular and have excelled at it so these are my theories. I could be wrong. Okay. America did not have a novel form that many European countries had, like Tom Jones or Don Quixote in Spain. It did also it also did not have a poetic tradition, right? So it needed something new. The short story form allows for more diverse voices to be heard, uh, like echoing America's diverse culture, right? Short story writers like Fitzgerald made a lot of money selling his short fiction to magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. Americans could feel literary without having to spend 28 hours reading Charles Dickens. That's so many hours I'm taking to read David Copperfield from Dickens right now. Well, worth it, but you know, that's that's a lot of investment. Americans, we also have short attention spans, right? We want to get get and read something uh, and move on. American writers like to experiment with the form and were encouraged with freedom and liberty of our national identity of individualism. And of course, Emerson and Poe were like big advocates of this um, and were largely respected, more so Emerson, I think. Um, Although um, Baudelaire in France really respected Poe and um, emulated a lot of his style. Um, But American innovation would also include you know, jazz, the blues, and rock and roll. And then America started influencing trends in fashion and music, so it kind of went the other way. It shifted. Europe had been the one that was influencing America. Now America, having come into its own, was now influencing the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who, and that kind of stuff. With, you know, early blues, early rock and roll. 
All right, so let's get to some essential questions, right? And this is the meat and potatoes for my students as you write your paper, right? So many of the stories we have read take place in the South and it contains Gothic elements. So how is the current conflict in the South regarding monuments revealed in Southern fiction of the unit, right? Flannery O'Connor and Rose for Emily. There are huge stories, all right, about about this. What are the causes for Southern reverence for the past? What do O'Connor, Faulkner, and Walker have to say about the Southern way of life? How does this compare to the North? What Gothic elements are at play in these stories? What is the South more prone? Why is the South more prone to the Gothic than the North? And what's the role of the supernatural? How does it correspond to elements of realism? Right? Why is the South more prone to supernatural elements than the North? Could it be anything to do with all the battlefields and all the ghosts and the destruction of the, the Southern way of life? Okay. Essential question number two. Why was existentialism popular after World War I? Now, this, of course, comes across in both of Hemingway's short stories. What is existentialism? And how does the myth of Sisyphus apply to stories by Steinbeck, Hemingway, etc.? Now, I'll have to give a lecture on the myth of Sisyphus, or you can just ask Uncle Google. But he was condemned to roll a boulder up a mountain and then have the boulder roll back down, and he would have to do this over and over and over again as punishment. The existentialist, uh, Camus, um, in his very famous essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, would say it's absurd, but at least he has his boulder, right? He has, he has a job to do. All right, question number three, and this was a big one we covered, is, you know, the role of women in society. What had been the traditional role for women in the past? What has changed? What has changed? What imprisons the women in the stories? How are they able to express themselves? And what are the differences between male and female authors in regard to women? Okay, we have Hemingway writing about women. Like in Hills Like White Elephants, we have Steinbeck. Um, but should we trust a woman to know more about what it's like to be a woman? Or, you know, in that time period, like Kate Chopin. And here we have a picture of uh, uh, Miss Allen, Mrs. Allen from uh, Eliza from the chrysanthemums tending her chrysanthemums. And then another essential question, use of force. What are a few forces, internal or external, in the character? Is use of force ever necessary? Right now, in William Carlos Williams, the use of force, he's actually using physical force. But in Hills Like White Elephants, the boyfriend, the American, is using force. How is uh, Steinbeck, uh, the husband, how is he passively using force? Uh, and of course, there's lots of stories where you have this type of physical force, whether internal or external. The yellow wallpaper, the husband is definitely using both mental and physical force to imprison his wife, all right? And how can one counter a force with civil disobedience? We do have characters in, this story, in these stories, and we'll get to civil disobedience with Thoreau and Bartleby, where they just refuse to cooperate with the authority, right? I'm saying, no, I'm stopping. I'm not doing what you want me to do. And of course, the race question, right? What does it mean to be black and to be an American? How does this equality relate to the pursuit of the American dream? How do these stories exhibit overt and implicit racism? And how do the characters transcend racism and societal barriers? Okay, so... Um, Flannery O'Connor, in her short story, um, A Good Man is Hard to Find, man, she is, she's pretty racist, right? She's like, look at, you know, she looks at the South the way the South used to be, and she still wants it to be that way, all right? So think about the stories we have read, if you're interested in comparing and contrasting uh, how race is revealed. And think about this, you know, how well can I answer these questions right now? You know, if you think, Mr. Bound, I know these stories, I could teach this stuff in my sleep, versus, yeah, Mr. Bound, listen, I'm a novice in American short fiction. So if you were to give yourself a rating, 
would you give yourself a four, three, two, or one? And hopefully by the end of this unit, uh, you're either getting this lecture at the beginning or you're getting this lecture at the end. But if you're a four, yeah, I could teach this stuff at the graduate school level, right? That would be fantastic, right? Mr. Bound, I could teach this better than you. Or versus one, yeah, I could teach this at the elementary school level. Not that you would teach these <laughs> stories like Big Blonde or Hell Heaven to elementary school children. That would really be uh, perhaps inappropriate. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, uh, listening to my lecture. Uh, take care and uh, have a good day. Be safe out there.